and Arlene here, and welcome back to the Welcome to the Hobby series that we have been doing here. Um, this is episode three, and it is going to be... Focusing on the different components of a blaster and how to test them accordingly. Yes. Much like our last two episodes, I have prepared questions. Yes. Because <laughs> so. this is the part, I think, I think this is the episode I'm most excited for, because this is where we really get into the... DIYing portion, yeah. which is which is what I, I enjoy getting your hands dirty. Yes. So, so yes. all right. Again, if you have any questions of your own, please leave them down below, and we'll answer them in our next uh, episode. All right. Or in the comments, which uh, however we work this out. <laughs> yes, exactly. All right. So, four. How the f does a goddamn blaster work? So specifically, I know um, that. I think the internal components and how they actually work to fire. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, it's not like a regular in real life blaster, if you will. There's mm -hmm. different components of it to obviously make it safer to use darts. Can you kind of go over the different styles? Because I know in our previous video, you said there's essentially two different types of blasters. Yes. And I assume the internal components are quite different between the two. Yes. The differences between a Springer and a flywheel are obviously are vastly different. One is, as a springer is, is based on a spring being compressed to then push forward a plunger down a tube to create air volume to then fire the dart out of the barrel at the end. Okay. Obviously the better your seal is, the, more, the better the pressure is to build behind the dart to actually fire it out. However, there are other components to that as well, like making sure you have proper barrel length because that will affect something because if your barrel is too short and you have too much pressure behind it you'll get what we lovingly always refer to as fishtailing which is the dart head will stay like straight but then the back end will just start whirly barreling all Isn't over that what the place. an arrow does when you shoot it from a, a bow? No that's what the, the fins are for. Oh, it's okay. th th those are I supposed thought, to. I thought they do like a curve. They do but it's like when you have like an inch and a half of foam, that's going to throw off your trajectory. Got it. Okay. Um, so that's why, so I've always wondered, because when uh, I've seen you make your own darts in the past, you've always right. made them so short. Yes. And I never understood that. So that makes significantly more sense. Yes, like that. because a full length dart, you have, obviously a full length dart is more mass. The problem is though, when all of your mass is at that tip and the body is basically the same kind of like weight just distributed throughout you the mass will kind of keep on trajectory but when you have all that pressure and then the velo the air you know the air velocity i'm slightly speaking out of my ass when it comes to these terminologies but we'll get the chance yeah but basically what will happen is as the air the airflow over the dart it starts it's basically turbulence okay is what causes that so when you shorten the dart, you basically make less turbulence. Okay. But if you, again, if you have too much pressure behind it and it's going too fast, you'll still cause the turbulence regardless. Basically, it's the barrel length helps you um, balance out speed and power. Okay. Because if it's the barrel is too long, then the dart's dragging on it too long, and therefore it's not going to have enough force when it comes out of the uh of the barrel so that's why you know you could build like you know this thing has like you know a monster like you know 50 pound spring but when you fire it it just goes Pfft. yeah so that's that's something you don't want out of a out of a gun especially when it it looks unimpressive you want it to yes. perform accordingly <laughs> yes exactly yes i'm looking at you <laughs> um so i think uh so for plunger or springers yes as they're called so you have the plunger that's what's pullback for me i because again for me again the, the higher the pressure right the more difficult and, it is to pull back right and, and it's then not that's going to then that would end up obviously pushing air through the chamber to the dart that then goes through the barrel the barrel yes. okay yes and it's not always necessarily the pullbacks okay um for a lot of the pump actions what it will do is because you also have to have a breach as well, because that's how the dart gets loaded into the barrel. Okay. 
Okay. So what what will happen a lot of times is the pullbacks are usually for something that's front loaded. Okay. Um, or you have to have a speed loader on it because then you're loading into the back end and you're basically in, basically putting the barrel in into chamber. Yeah. Um, for the springers, for a majority of them that are pump action, usually it's pump action or even a top prime. Um, I've only, I think I've only ever actually used pump action for like water guns specifically. Right. Not, I don't think I've ever actually used them for the Nerf blaster before. Right, and we will have a segment showing the internal so you'll be able to see yeah. of a basic alpha trooper of what would, or, you know. <laughs> we're going to have a overview of the internals of a very basic Nerf branded blaster because that's going to be based, it, it kind of is the quintessential this is what everything got built off of. Mm -hmm. So you'll see how that works and all. What the pump action does is there's a either a sled or a direct attachment to the breech that pushes that back, which essentially then pushes your plunger back mm -hmm. into position so that that compresses okay. the spring. So instead of the pullback action, you're basically pushing it back. Okay. So I guess that's will come when we get to that point. It's yeah. kind of deciphering what kind of spring that you need, like how, how much PSI from that you need, how, right. how the testing of how long the barrel you should have, things like that. There's right. so many different components here. So yes. much physics. My physics yes. professor, professor would be so upset that I don't remember any of this. A lot, <laughs> honestly, a lot of people who, or at least in my, in my experience, a lot of people who have gotten into the hobby have actually been, uh, have actually studied engineering. Mm -hmm. And hence... You know, a lot of this basically comes down to it. It's not just physics, it's also engineering as well. Yeah. So, if you're not smart with that stuff, do not worry. Believe me. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you'll figure it out. You'll get there. I majored in telecommunications, so I know next to nothing about this stuff. This is all self-learned stuff. And it's stuff, again, it sounds very complicated, like, oh, I'm never going to get it. I'm never going to get it. it. It will all come with time. I was about to say, I feel like that's kind of part of the fun of it is you do it, you test it, you would go back, adjust. Yeah. That is that that test mm -hmm. test fix, test fix yeah. kind of scenario and you get kind of the satisfaction of I'm doing this to the specifications that I want. Right. And a, it's and honestly I'll say this. In where the hobby is now, it's a lot easier to do that kind of stuff maybe a little bit more expensive depending on how you look at it but it's a lot easier to do that now than back when i started yeah because there wasn't like manufacturers for parts it, well not even just so manufacturers for parts everyone made their it was back when everyone made their own darts so every dart was different Got like it. you know like out of like a batch of 100 that i made like you know 70 would be great 10 would be perfect and then the others would just be like well this sucked. <laughs> quality you know. control. Yeah, there. Yeah, every. Yeah, it's the quality quality control. Plus, also we were using PVC for barrels, so we would start with a long length of PVC, cut it down, cut it down, cut it down, cut it down, so we found it. Then trimmed a little bit more, realized, oh wait, we didn't have to do it. Then we have to go get another piece of PVC and redo it all over again. So. You know, I. I realize I've seen like saws mm -hmm. all the time in movies. Never understood why. I'm like they. Makes that so much more understandable <laughs> of why they do that. Yes. Okay. So that's the more into the Springer style. Is the flywheel significantly different? Is it kind of the same? What are the? It's. And I, we again, we're gonna have demonstrations like I said earlier. This will be a long episode. Yeah. <laughs> there's gonna be there's gonna be demonstrations in between of internals of again very basic setups of it. Um, with flywheels, it's. You have batteries, you have a rev trigger, you have motors, you have flywheels. Um, the flywheels are what actually impart the spin onto your dart. Okay. Like, for the majority of things, you don't need, like... Okay, so for a Springer going a bit more advanced, um, the barrels are smooth. Like, with a actual real steel projectile... You have rifling in a barrel. Rifle, rifling will impart spin on the projectile, which then gives it its basic, which with the spin, 
that's how it okay. maintains its trajectory. With a Nerf dart, you don't really have that, or a half dart, whatever you use. But it's without the rifling, it's just a smooth bore, and it just will go out. So there's no spin on it. We have, over the years, not only developed, but now companies are manufacturing them, uh, something called a scar barrel, which was actually uh, originally designed with fishing line. And what it did was it basically just added rifling to the front end of it. So you lose power once it hits the scar barrel, but yeah. you add that spin to the dart so that it stays on target. A flywheel, you can actually have it like cantered. You can have it designed to where it will impart spin on the dart to begin with. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to worry about a scar barrel at that point. There are those who will argue the point of no, a scar barrel does help a flywheel. There are those in the camp that it doesn't. I will say this. I know the bare minimum of flywheels because I've always been a Springer guy. I know enough to be dangerous. And so, <laughs> so I really can't say heads or tails on that one. Okay. Like I've heard from people who've worked on tons of them saying, no, you don't need it. Then I've also spoken with people who've worked a ton on them saying, yeah, it does help. So, so. A, for what I'm hearing is, again, you have to do test yeah. fix, test fix. I assume you want to start with it and then take it away. Kind of do that. With, I'll say this. With a Springer, I would say start with scar barrels. Okay. With a flywheel, if you're having that much trouble getting something to stay on target, then I would maybe impart into, like, a scar barrel or something like that. Okay. Um, because the whole thing, the whole idea with the flywheel is there's no air pressure. It's the wheels basically just going pew yeah. with the, uh, with the darts. So you don't have that air pressure constantly moving it. It's basically once it flings it, there's your energy. Okay. So for a flywheel, a lot of times you're not going to see them in very long barrels. Um, either that or usually what they'll do is they'll p add in something what's called an afterburner. So, for example... I'm so glad we have a shop full of all these things. Yes. <laughs> the Halo Blaster. This is a flywheel blaster. Your flywheel cage is all the way back here. The rest of this is just barrel. Oh, okay. So, if I were to, say, modify this for performance, which... I would have the cage here to add the initial to get it down range, and then I would have an afterburner here, so that this way, once it goes from here, it hits the second flywheels, and that will be your actual projectile. Interesting. Okay, that makes significantly more sense. I just know it makes things shoot without me having to use any of my wimpy arms. Yes. So that's I've never really thought about it, but that's it seems pretty straightforward, kind of all in all. It is. But, where, but where, it does seem more complicated than that because you have those uh, that electricity kind of running through it, doing all of that. Yeah, when you're work when you're working on a flywheel, you have to because a lot of times we'll upgrade them to lipos, which if you're doing that, please be careful. Lipos can be dangerous. Yeah, I don't know what that is. It, <laughs> it's a it's a very tiny battery that holds a lot of charge, but if you kind of are not. Um, if you're a little too rough with it, it will explode. Oh, okay then. Yes. Don't do that. Yes. <laughs> um, but I mean, like, there are lipos in a lot of facets in life. Like, there are lipo batteries in phones. There's yeah. lipo batteries in RC cars, um, airsoft uh, guns, paintball markers. You know. That sounds like a leave it to the professionals type of thing. Well, again, with time, you'll, yeah. you'll learn how to work better with them. But when you're doing, the, when you're upgrading something to that point, you're going to have to replace basically all the wiring because the, wi the, the stock wiring is not designed for that unless it already has something in there. Like the Dart Zone Pro Mark III, it runs off of, I think it's like six or eight AA batteries. You can actually, oh. you can actually remove the tray and it actually does have a... Lipo, can, uh, lipo, I think it's an XT60 or 30. I'm not sure. That I'll, means nothing. I'll fit, I'll fit it down here, <laughs> but it basically has a connector for a lipo battery. Okay. 
So you can remove the battery tray and put a LiPo in to actually up, Interesting. up okay. the motors on it. But it's designed to do that. If you just go into a Strife, you know, solder those to, like, the, the battery terminals, you're going to burn the thing out or possibly, you know, cause yourself severe harm. So don't do that. If you're doing that, you have to rewire the entire thing. You also then have to upgrade the motors because the stock motors are not designed to take that kind of voltage. Oh, that's a lot. Seriously, yes. this is all the physics class I wish I remembered. <laughs> <laughs> but, and then a lot of times you have, with the flywheels, the basic ones are semi-automatic, which means you only fire one dart at a time. When you start getting into the complicated and the bigger ones, you're then the talking cycle. about full auto, which means you have to replace your pusher. Yeah. Or if you have like a three round burst or whatever. Um, the Rapid Strike and a couple of others actually use a conveyor belt system. Oh no, I'm sorry, the Rapid Strike does not, but there are um, Nerf guns that actually use a conveyor belt. So instead of a, a pusher either connected to a motor or just manually linked to the uh, trigger. It's just nonstop. Yeah, it's just once you rev, that's going. And then when you pull the trigger, that's when the, uh, the belt will move to start just automatically moving the darts into your flywheels. Yes. So. All right. So thank you for covering all that. So now we have essentially all these internal parts highlighted. Mm -hmm. Now I think the more fun part is how to actually test sure you're getting out of it what you want um what what do you qualify as the good qualities to test for with a blaster um the most basic way to at least again my opinion the basic way to test to see how something is performing is doing flat tests flat shots how far does the dart go? How how much does it stay on target? And how far does it go before it starts dipping? Okay. Um, in most cases, like a stock a stock battle, or if you're playing in an arena that's like close quarters or something, you want at least something that can go 25 feet flat. Okay. Um, you don't want some. I mean, you also don't want something that's like super powered in that aspect especially stock but in a cqb arena or you know close quarters combat or battle however you want to call it if you can hit 25 feet flat you're doing good okay. you don't want to use something that's obviously shooting like 250 uh feet per second and yeah. using that at 25 feet yes that's going to hurt and that's going to leave a mark and the person you shot is not going to be happy with you yes um but at that point, you're 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 basically you kind you test for what you want to use it for. Um, obviously, with anything stock, you want it to at least you want it to clear the 25 feet. Because if not, then in my opinion, as fun as it would be, it may not be worth it. Okay. Um, at that point, you're better off just turning it into a prop or something. But yeah, you want at least 25 feet. Uh, if you're going for high-end play like uh, something like APOC or um, like competitive something like that you obviously want the distance so at that point maybe you're looking for 50 feet flat or maybe with a slight like 5 to 10 degree lift not like a 20 degree um, you can hit 75 feet you when it comes to the FPS again I know I mentioned it previously like you know when it comes to like stock, super stock, competitive, you kind of like look for those thresholds. Again, FPS is not the be all end all. Um, years ago, uh, a uh, did FPS that's frames per second. At least that's feet, my, feet per second. Feet per second, right? Yeah. I, I know in so, camera stuff. That's yes. that's my realm. No, so it, when when second, I'm talking okay. to FPS, it's feet per second, which okay. means that's how quick the dart is actually traveling. Um, but that again can be very very easily manipulated um psych who is a nerfer in singapore uh who i would like to say is at least an acquaintance <laughs> um but he's been doing this probably as long as i have if not longer 
but he was always really good with like testing stuff and also kind of like not dismissing but kind of like at least in this case like disproving things because like somebody would say like would like post up a break oh i got this to shoot 350 feet per second it's so awesome and he actually did a test where he showed that oh yeah i did this and then all he did was like change the barrel Mm -hmm. to where it should have been and all of a sudden it's shooting at like 150. interesting so okay so because a lot of times the fps is measured right from where the dart's coming out of the barrel okay so i was about to say my question is how how do you test that like do you take a stopwatch shoot it start it and then where it lands you stop the stopwatch and see how far it went and do that math um no it's a lot easier now because we use chronographs oh chronograph yes okay the chronograph um this earlier. I know nothing. <laughs> Can't you tell? <laughs> okay, so this is a chronograph. It what it does is it has two points within this little chamber here that basically are light barriers. Okay. So when it when your projectile breaks one barrier, mm-hmm. it starts measuring, and when it breaks the second one, it stops. Okay. So it will then calculate. It looks like a or just a, a, a speed gun or whatever. Kind, well, well, this is a tripod, so yeah. it's like, pew! <laughs> but essentially, this is how you would wind up measuring um, how, how quickly your darts are leaving their barrels. Um, this one I got on Amazon. It was, I think, about 60 bucks or so. Okay. A lot of people will swear by the... Um, Oh, I can't think of the name right now. It escapes me. But it's the uh, the green chronographs that, like, Drac uses. Uh, Captain Xavier uses those. Those are basically the quote-unquote professional chronographs. Um, those are designed to measure just about everything. That's specifically an airsoft one. So it does also take into consideration, like, um, weight of things and, uh, and other stuff to measure where... The professional ones, like the gray and the green ones, and I'll have like a picture here or something. Or oh, my face. <laughs> no, th- I, I have enough space between us to do it. But those are like the more professional ones where it's just, it doesn't matter what you're firing. It just tells you how quick that thing is moving. Okay. Um, but yeah, chronographs can, get ex- can actually get quite expensive. The reason I don't have... Uh, one of those high-end ones is because I don't want to spend a hundred and something dollars on it. Yeah, no, especially if you get for like half the price. Yeah, I mean this works for what I, that works for what I need it for, so I don't feel the need to do it. And also, when it comes to me, it's like I'm not always measuring specifically for FPS. I, you know, FPS readings. I'm after I see how good it's like actually firing. Like, oh, I got this up to 240. Oh, I got this up to 250. Whatever. Then I go outside and see if I can hit anything with it. Because no matter how fast the dart is traveling, if you can't hit the broadside of a barn with it, then it's not, it doesn't matter at that point. Yeah, accuracy, I feel like that's yeah. more important than anything, in yeah. my and, opinion. And there is always the joke with, you know, nerf accuracy is, you know, in the eye of the beholder. But, because, uh, you know, there was always the joke, there's never a true sniper in nerf because... You know, you can have a pistol that reaches the range of a long rifle. Yeah. But. And also, I would assume because darts are quite light. Yes. Wind. <laughs> yes, wind will also <laughs> obviously affect things. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, the. In my opinion, the best way to test something is can it hit, can it hit a target that far, this far away? How many times could you hit it? Okay. So. So it, I'm assuming that's not just the blaster itself; it's also the user. Yeah, because with within that, I mean, obviously you do have to practice to hit something, um, and even when it comes to like you know sights and optics or whatever, a lot of the, a lot of times it's just kind of cool to have like you know a scope on something or yeah. you know those really fancy iron sights or whatever. I will be honest, when I finished up my long shot, 
yes, I have a little scope on here now. Yes, it's cool. Does it function? Yes, but I still need to like kind of fine tune it. I was using this with the plastic iron sights that it came with, and I was actually hitting targets pretty well off. So, you know, it's, again, it's a lot of times it's the user, but optics help sometimes. Okay, I was about to say, because especially when it comes to users, uh, I know with some of, specifically like the spring ones, depending on how much force gets built up in there, you will get some form of kickback. Is that something that you ever have to take into consideration? A lot of times recoil doesn't matter. Um, the spring load will prove to be, the spring load can be a, can be an issue when it comes to priming. Like a lot of times when, back in the day when we modified the original Nerf long strike, it was a bolt action blaster. With its stock, you can use either side of it. If you oversprung that thing, you'd have to basically put it against your hip, grab both sides, and pull back on both of the priming handles oh, in order to prime it. Because if you just tried doing it on one side with that load, you would crack the bolt sled. Okay. So. Yeah, that, that was going to be my next uh, kind of question in terms of other qualities to look for was reload speed. Because obviously with the Springers, mm -hmm. that will take some, that's more manual, being able to actually right. get yourself back into position to reprime it, having the strength to do that if, the, if it does require a lot of force. And then specifically with the flywheels, since those are battery operated, you, like you said, most of those are just ones. Mm -hmm. How, what's the, I guess, the time distance between the two um, for the ones that do more than one at once and this did just keep going, that timing. So things like that, are there any, is there any way to really measure those or? Um, when it comes to the flywheels, um, again, something like with the chronograph that I have, you can actually measure how fast something is firing. Because it, since it's designed for airsoft, you can actually get uh, rounds per minute or rate of fire. Okay. The when it comes to a Springer, it really is all how fast you can basically prime it. Okay. So on a light load, you can prime pretty quickly. Um, on a heavier load, obviously, it you know the heavier the spring, the more force it's going to be to prime it. Yeah. You know that. Oh, far <laughs> too well. I wish that it, I assume there is a way to measure. The amount of force required. Yeah. The, well, I feel like I for me, when I would be designing a blaster, that's obviously something I know I need to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. So it's something I would, I guess, want to measure first before, like, we select, like, a different well, type of spring and things like well, that. Well, you can, act, well, depending on where you get the spring from, it will actually tell you, or you can find out how much it takes to basically compress that spring. Mm -hmm. Like, with the springs that we get from... Uh, worker. It will say this is an 8 kilogram spring, this is a 10 kilogram oh, spring, okay. this is a 15 kilogram spring. It's basically, that's the compression force. I genuinely thought that was the weight of the spring. No. <laughs> at least, at least, as like, far as that, I know. That, that makes significantly more sense, because kilograms is a lot. Yes. So I was just like, oh, I guess it's like, I, I don't know, I thought it was like the width of the coil and like, yeah. how that and, to weight and that will, And that will also... Um, like how like how much you could hold, I think, I think is what I'm talking about. Not necessarily how much to compress. Right. Well, with the, well, I mean, therein lies the thing. Like, if you have a sp if you have a spring like uh, for a garage door, it has the loops on the ends, and it comes already compressed. Mm -hmm. That's a tension spring where it's you're opening it. The yeah. compression springs are basically the flat springs that you go squish. Got it. Okay. Compressing. Different direction. Different metric. Okay. I've just been looking at different springs. Good to know. <laughs> That's fair. And then, Again, this is why we're doing. This is why we're doing. Also, that. I apologize about this. This is it's just it's we're hot. recording on a hot day today. <laughs> and then I think my only other question about different things I guess look for in quality, ease of use specifically in terms of accessibility. Because again, I don't have the strength for that. Is right. there like I, I know we've discussed um, in our first videos when we talk about different brands. There are brands that are just easier to use, especially stock specifically. Um, right. Is do you have any tips or ideas about making Nerf Blaster use more accessible? 
Um, I would say it, I mean, it, it comes down to kind of also going back to the first episode, kind of like what you want out of it. If yeah. you want something that you can just basically throw on a workbench or a table, tinker with it for a couple of minutes, swap like one or two parts out to get something a little better out of it, you're better off with the Springer. Okay. Even if it's just going in there, removing the locks that are in there just to like kind of, again, make things a little easier to use where, you know, it, it, where it's, you're not doing a heavy mod, you're just making things, a, I, I'm, I'm fumbling on this one. But no, it's okay. It, I, it's a tough question. To, yeah. But I figured it's obviously that everyone has a strength. Maybe it's right. just doing the like, prime, doing two-handed. It because I assume that's also coordination, being able to do that. And it can, I'm not particularly coordinated. It can be. Okay. At that point, you, if if you don't feel that you would have the strength to use like a heavy spring blaster, where and I will say this, with the more modernized offerings like. Even the new X shot long shot, because there's a bearing in the prime. Um, the Dart Zone Pro Mark IV, which is their new thing, there are bearings in that prime as well. So even with a heavier spring, it's actually easier to prime it. Okay. Um, See, stuff like that. Those right. kind of parts I didn't know about. So I was, right. I was, well, that is exactly well, again, why I that, that question. That, that's a much more recent addition to it. Yeah. But, and I'll even say this, I have a friend um, in the community who I've known for years and love him dearly, uh, Jackson, um, he's missing part of his arm. Okay. And he has a spring blaster that was very competitive and it's gotten tagged, and I've gotten tagged with a couple of times as well, that he is able to use. So, I mean, don't think just because, you know, there are things in your life that may have been beyond your control or whatever. You can still definitely, you know, find do ways this. to do it. You can still find ways to do this. If you don't want to try that route and figure it out, that's what, that's the, the uh, in my opinion at that point, that's the upside of a flywheel blaster. Because yeah. then all you have to do is just two fingers, rev trigger, and then trigger. And sometimes not even that. I'll, what a lot of the um, hobby created stuff, like, for example, the Worker Nightingale. There is no red trigger on this. This is a flywheel blaster, and all you have to do is hold it down just slightly to start revving the trigger, and then once it goes down all the way, you'll then start uh, pushing, the uh, pusher will start feeding darts into there. So, Interesting. this one is designed to have very quick rev up. So as soon as like you kind of like put any pressure on the trigger, the flywheels automatically start going. You push through, the dart will go through, you let go, it will slow down. But then as soon as you do that, it will rev up to fire the dart. Very cool. Awesome. It's all good yeah. things to consider. Yes. For sure. And there's also hammer prime blasters like the hammer shot and the um, the trailblazer. My hands are too small to do that. <laughs> I know we we we've, we got to figure something out for that I one. I know I'm but. so little. It's a problem, but no, it's again it's great, especially for I'm sure younger viewers that want to get into the hobby earlier, mm -hmm. which I think would be awesome, uh, and things like that. Obviously, get your parents' permission before you do anything, and Always. especially playing with tools. Always. All right, all right, and kind of the last question on this is kind of about when you're getting stock. How do you or how do you choose? I guess this is the one I want to mod, or maybe this one's just so horrible, I shouldn't use it. Like, it was just bad out of the box. Mm -hmm. Unless. Well. Okay, so, when it comes to that, unless you're getting a really, kind of, very knockoff blaster, most things should work as advertised. I will make the exception to the Busby Thundershock, or whatever it was. Their Hammer Prime blaster was... <laughs> That's no. It, it it's large, it's clunky, and it's overall was just not a good design. Plus, there were a lot of 
there was uh, production issues with it, too. Oh, it's not secured oh. properly. Oh, dear. Yeah, that's a whole different oh, story. Okay. <laughs> you get something that says, oh, it's supposed to do X, Y, and Z, and it's not, chances are it's a limit. You can always return it back to the store and be like, hey, this doesn't work. You get another one. If it's doing the same thing, then that may just be a crap blaster. Um, Should you bother with trying to mod it to get it to do said X, Y, Z, or... Well, therein lies the uh, well. Therein lies the flip side to it. Like, if you get something and it's not performing well or whatever, but you were planning on maybe modifying it anyway, whether it's a lemon or not, at that point, if you're going to mod it, you're going to mod it. Uh, there are things to take in consideration. Um, obviously, a one-piece Springer is most probably going to be the easiest thing to work on. Um, same thing with a semi-automatic flywheel blaster. But once you start getting into, let's say, more, we'll, we'll just we'll call them what they are. Once you get into more of the gimmick side of things, okay. like, for example, my dead man's tail over there um, is a lever action blaster. In order to properly utilize the lever action in that thing, it utilizes a gear system. Okay. Gears are going to cause problems because gears can slip, so then you'd have to replace the gears. Um the, you, you up the spring load, you'd have to make sure, you know, the lever can handle it, you know, something to that effect. Um, the opposite side of that is you can get external lever kits, like for the takedown or the Saturn, they have, they're both pump action rival blasters, which fire the little foam balls. <laughs> we really haven't talked much about rival just because rival's more of a niche thing. It's, it's there, it's usable, but... It's also for, like, every one rival blaster, there's, like, 20 or 30 other people using So that's more like the, this series, again, is welcome to the hobby. Yes. We're working our way, yeah. <laughs> yes. I am not discounting rival as something horrible or don't use it. I personally like rival. I have a Saturn. I have a takedown. I have a Prometheus over there, which I would love to use at a game one day, but I just don't feel like picking up all those rounds. <laughs> but, again, it's... You know, it's something that is out there. They both utilize the same type of things. Flywheels for um, for rival blasters is a little different. The springers are on par with where a dart springer is. So, but yeah, if you were planning on modif the uh, with the gimmicks and all that stuff, like the going back in the day, the Nerf um, barrel break. You could modify that, but then you also have to take into consideration that the brake action on that was how the blaster primed, so then you have a lot more moving components. Um, more moving components, I will say this, just lead to more problems. Um, but sometimes you may want to tinker with those just to see what you can do with it, because usually the more moving parts and the more gimmicky blasters are also kind of the more fun looking ones. So, yeah. And it's know, all about fun at the end of the day. Yes. That's, that's what this whole hobby is about, is yes. enjoying not just the product itself and the hard work that you may or may not be putting into it. You might just like it just as stock or mm -hmm. as is. And you just, you have to like it. Yeah. And I mean, like, there are stock blasters out there that look totally fine as they are. Like That, that giant Destiny one you got the other day. Oh, uh, my Gallagher, yes. It's so pretty. Yes, my Gallahorn. Um, I freaking love that thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, you could paint it up to look like the original one, but honestly, the way it is now, especially since they added that skin into the game, mm -hmm. I mean, it's perfectly serviceable as is. It looks really, really neat. The Halo, uh, the Halo assault rifle, again, looks really, really nice. The X shot, long shot. Yes, I did do my modified one, as I said I was going to. But even just the stock look of it looks dope. Yeah. So, I mean, there are things out there that you don't have to modify to just enjoy. You can just get those to enjoy those, and that's also 100% fine. So. There you go. All right. I think that kind of answers all my questions about what is the heck is inside of these damn things <laughs> and how it functions. Yes. So, so. awesome. All right. So, well, I hope you enjoyed this uh addition to the series we have a couple more in the series coming out so but as always 
Thank you for joining us for this video. And as always, if you enjoy the content we put here on the channel, please throw us a like and subscribe. Leave a comment down below. Let us know what you're thinking of this. Or if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them below. I will be answering them. And maybe I'll get Arlene to answer one or two finally. <laughs> when you tell me there is one to answer, I answer it. Fair. <laughs> but, oh, and don't forget uh, to click that little bell icon. Otherwise, you may not know when we're doing our silliness here on the channel. Mm -hmm. And also to keep up to date on the Welcome to the Hobby series. Also, P.O. Box. So proud. Snail mail. <laughs> um, but again, thank you for joining us. We'll see you guys next time. Bye. Later.